Welcome, everyone. Mics are a little dodgy, I'm sorry. I'm Jackie LaFaro, director of the festival. Thank you. Thank you. It's you who should be thanked, and all of the documentary filmmakers around who make the wonderful films that you come and see. So we are here tonight. It's a very special night. It's our gala night where we honor one of the icons, legends, although she's with us still, uh, in the world of documentary film, and that is Barbara Koppel. And so you'll, you'll be, the sequence for tonight, just let me tell you, is that Susan Lacey is going to be giving you some opening remarks. We're going to watch a, a, a trailer, the highlights of Barber's films, seven minutes, and then we're going right into Harlan County, USA. And then there will be a Q&A after. So I ask you all, I know you, sometimes you just have to run out, but try not to, because it'll be a wonderful conversation with Julie Anderson and Barbara. So, I just want to quickly thank two of our big sponsors who, without their support, this festival would not be entirely possible, and that is Bridgehampton National Bank and Claudia Pilato are here somewhere. Thank you very much, Claudia and the bank. And Brown Harris Stevens for our audience award, which is always good. So let me just say a few words about another honoree that we have had who we just couldn't do anything without, and that is Susan Lacey. And Susan, <laughs> Susan for, I'll just bring you up to date, for 27 years you all know this, Susan was executive producer, creator of, and executive producer of American Masters, 200, <laughs> Documentary biographies, brilliant, all of them, all of them, all of them. And now Susan um, has launched her own ship, and she is, has her own company called Pentimento Productions. And she is making her own documentary film. She has a, a multi-film contract with HBO Documentaries, and we'll be doing lots of other things, so we'll keep track of Susan. So Susan, that is your cue to come and say a few words about Barbara. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. It was 28 years <laughs> and 215 films. <laughs> but who's counting? I am so honored to have been asked to do this tonight about one of my favorite people. If one were to ask a random sampling of people on the street to name some documentary filmmakers, there are very few whose name would consistently be mentioned, if any. But if there were one, it would surely be Barbara Koppel. For nearly four decades, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Barbara. <laughs> we are at that point. <laughs> Barbara's body of work has provided a vital and socially progressive voice through an extraordinary range of work, proving that documentaries can not only be pure form of human expression, but an important part of world history. Barbara learned her craft from the ground up. First with the Maisels, Albert and David, doing very, very, doing every conceivable job from sound recording to cutting tape to editing everything before striking out on her own. And she hit home runs right out of the park from the very beginning. Winning two Oscars in a row for Holland County, USA, and The American Dream, both of which depicted with abiding sympathy the plight of ordinary people struggling with economic oppression and class strife, strife in America. Both were uncompromising and courageous films, which transcended traditional narrative in every way by revealing how the political, 
resonates with the deeply personal. And Barbara was in the trenches with her subjects, earning their trust and their confidence, and carrying her own camera and sound recording equipment. Barbara was the first woman to win two Oscars for documentary filmmaking. And Harlan County is only the second documentary to be placed in the US United States National Registry of Film Treasures. That is an amazing thing. Congratulations. <laughs> Since then, Barbara's clear but quiet politic has ranged from the dramatically powerful to the lighthearted and delightful. Her subjects range from portraits of Woody Allen, Mike Tyson, and George Steinbrenner to gun rights and gun control, to free speech and social justice, to drug addiction, women's human rights, no nukes, high school musicals, the Hamptons, Woodstock, the economy, the history of the nation magazine, US labor issues, and madness. Barbara has consistently dared to go where others don't. Her film on AIDS was the first film on this subject to appear on the Disney Channel. And she is one of the very few documentary filmmakers who has crossed over into features and episodic television with great success. At the heart of all of Barbara's films is the quest for the American dream. As a storyteller, and she is a great storyteller, she captures authentic human moments which place her films actually beyond category. Her films and her honors are way too numerous to mention, but they all have something in common. Barbara gives voice to the voiceless. She unearths complex human realities by telling a different side to the story than the one we thought we knew. She is loyal to reality and not an agenda. So, Barbara, the Hamptons Take Two Festival is honored to be honoring you tonight, and I am honored to be your friend. Thank you for your films, which are a testament to human dignity and the heroic spirit of resistance. You have given us the magic of the truth and a discourse that cuts through historical time to help us, to help us understand where we are today and why. And that is quite an achievement. Congratulations. So Julie, Julie Anderson, who is the executive director of Gimenaries and Development at WPBS um, NET, and on the advisory board of the, this film festival, We'll be having a conversation with Barbara Koppel oh. and Mira Bank. Oh, so enjoy. Okay. <laughs> um, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes, you can. OK, thank you. Barbara, it's amazing to watch this film again. And Mira, we just met tonight. But it's amazing. Must have been great memories looking back at the making of this film. So I, I mean, Barbara is such an accomplished filmmaker. The, the visuals that you see in these films are extraordinary. Barbara, can you just talk to us a little bit? <laughs> Take your gum out. Um, the scenes that you got are so personal, so close up, so amazing. How did you earn the respect of the miners? That, that they, they're very private people. They're not used to people from outsiders coming into their lives. And this is something, this is a life and death situation for them. And here you are, this outsider person who's come into their life. How did you earn enough respect from them and trust so that you were allowed to get this kind of scenes and emotion? Well, it wasn't easy. <laughs> um, when we first went to Harlan County, we had been following, as you know, um, the Miners for Democracy, and Miller got in against Tony Boyle, and his first promise was to organize the unorganized. 
And so we wanted to see if he would keep his promise. So the first place that we went to was Harlan County. And so we, we went to the picket line and you know, we probably looked like something they had never seen before, you know, long hair and shawls and <laughs> we didn't really fit in and they didn't know whether we were, you know, working for the company or who we were. And so they said, okay, you can be on the picket line tomorrow morning at 5.30 a.m. And we said, great. So we went up Pine Mountain and there was a little motel there and we stayed there and then at 4.30 in the morning we started coming down the mountain. It was really wet and slippery, there were no guardrails and another car sort of passed us by and we flipped over. And we promised we would be on the picket line. We were all okay, there were three of us and we just took the gear out and we walked all the way to the picket line. And they just led us into their hearts and homes after that because news travels fast. You know, when they first started um, talking to us and they didn't trust us, they wouldn't even give us their right names. They told us they were Martha Washington and Florence Nightingale and things like that. You know but that's how it started. I mean, it's just amazing. Where did you stay? Did you stay in that hotel? Did you end up staying with some of the miners? Well, both. At the very beginning, we stayed at the um, hotel, at motel. Um, and then when things started heating up, we stayed with the miners so that they could protect us. Uh, because we were, I was told that if I was ever caught alone at night, I'd be killed. So I was not going to be caught alone at night. So and also the first sort of week I was there at the motel, one of the organizers, Houston Elmore, called me in and he opened this suitcase and there were all these guns. And he said, okay, well you have to pick one. And I grew up in Scarsdale, New York. <laughs> that, was, that was the furthest thing from my mind was to pick up a gun, but I saw a tiny little pink gun, <laughs> so <laughs> I took that one, but of course I never used it. But I did learn later on in the struggle how to use 357 Magnums and high-powered rifles that you'd sort of put on your shoulder and, you know, you get very bruised from them. Well, clearly things heated up over the course of time. There's the first scene where uh, the, the um, mine guy comes out and you have that shot of and you you somehow got around him to behind him and you could see the the gun poking out of his pocket even though he's just keeping his hand there and then as we go forward through time then there are the shots in that i assume that's five in the morning when these shots rang out it's very very dark and you're there with your camera and the camera looks like someone bumped into it somehow or was there how was your what was the fear factor for you? What, how often were, did you feel like you were in danger? And did you feel like the miners were protecting you? Because you, you know, you're putting yourself out there too. Well, I was very young. So, you know, when you're young, you think you're invincible and nothing's gonna happen to you. But yeah, it was pretty scary when they started shooting machine guns um, at us with tracer bullets that lit up the mountainside, and um, I sort of felt in charge because uh, I had brought the cameraman who um, was Hart Perry and Ann Lewis who was doing, you know, the assistant camera at that time um, with me, and I felt, okay, I have to protect them. So when they started coming across the bridge I had my nagra on because I did sound from here to here and you know a fish pole with a mic and walked forward and they started kicking me and everything but it didn't hurt because I had all this protection on me but you know they knocked the camera out of Hart's hand and Hart you know had some some bad things happen but it was okay, and I started, I was so mad, I started swinging with my microphone at them, 
So. You were mad, not scared. Well, I was scared, but I was mad, you know, that anybody would hurt us. Yeah. So, Mira, I'd like to ask you a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Enough about me. <laughs> um, when did you come into the project, and what did you see? And also, you had somebody who is very close to you, right inside the United yeah. Mine Workers, your brother, Rick yeah. Banks, who didn't want us there at all, right? <laughs> so maybe <laughs> you could talk about it's your interesting role. Yeah, no, well, I really, I was, I was just an adjunct to the, to the project, really, but my, my memory of this period was um, my brother had been, um, uh, he was a lawyer you know, uh, with uh, Vista and then got involved with the Miners for Democracy project and came on as the counsel to Arnold Miller. So he was involved in, uh, and he was very close to, to the Yablonsky family. And I remember, you know, this period, what I remember about it was the degree of violence involved because he was with and around the Yablonskis when uh, Jock was killed. And then when they were organizing to get Arnold elected, um, there were many death threats for those people. And Bernie Aronson, uh, I went to high school with. I mean, Barbara grew up in Scarsdale. I grew up in Rye. <laughs> Everybody wound up in the coal fields in, in I didn't know West you Virginia. went to high school with Bernie. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, my sense of it was that it was a, um, it was kind of a life commitment that people were making. It was kind of commitment that um, certainly Barbara was making and Hart as, as filmmakers. And in my brother's case, um, you know, stayed with the union movement his entire working life um, and eventually wound up as the director of collective bargaining for the AFL-CIO, left that a little while ago. But that period of time, people felt they were doing something um, that was a, a, a struggle on, on the level of I wouldn't say, you know, kind of Greek myth, but it had that kind of, I mean, you can see it in the faces of these people and, yeah. and in the way that they speak. There was something elemental about this. And I wanted to say that um, as I'm watching the film, I feel like the characters in the film and the filmmaker, Barbara and her team, share a, a sense of, of commitment, determination, courage, tenacity, candidness, guilelessness, where this is something that is so deep and so pure and so much you believe in. And you shared that sense of commitment and tenacity in terms of making your own film. And I agree, the people that you've captured were incredibly heroic, in particular the women. So I want to talk a little bit about the women. And Lois, do you think that were, not, would, were the women instrumental in helping the strike? survive and succeed ultimately? Oh, I think the women were totally instrumental. I mean, they weren't afraid of anything. For years, they had watched their husbands go down in their mind and, you know, the roof falling on them or coming back with black lung and, you know, or just not feeling good and not getting wages. And this was their time and their moment to really do something to change things. And Lois Scott, for me, I mean, we really clicked. We really adored each other. And she was, for me, a role model. I mean, I never saw anyone who was so clear and so precise and so unafraid to do things. Yes, I think, and she, I think you and she share a lot of the same qualities. She's certainly amazing on screen, and you're amazing to have captured what we see on screen. So bravo to all the women who are out there battling for things they, and a lot of courage is being exhibited there. Um, you know, a, 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 another comment about just the fact that you got so much access is that you're the kind of filmmaker who's, you're not a, back of the room nodding, not wanting to make your presence felt. Your camera is always close up. It's always right in the middle of the heart of the scene. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how you do that. You know, you're 
always right there. There's lots of incredible close-ups here. The, the characters are clearly not, no somehow not noticing that you're there, and yet you're there to capture. How do you do that? Well, um, Hart, who is uh, one of the main camera people and also another um, cameraman named Kevin Keating, um, was another. And I did the sound, and I used the use of um, wireless mics at that time. Way back then, they were a lot bigger. But I could always hear everything that was going on. And so, you know, we would be pointed in the right direction all the time of where there was a crisis or where there was friction. And getting into the jail, for example, I mean, all you had to do is I had um, Hart's battery belt, and I just sort of smiled and winked at the, at the jailer, seriously. And we just walked right in, and we got free range to do what we wanted. In the courtroom, you know, they kept us out. We opened the door from afar, but I had wired, um, you know, a lot of the female characters, and, you know, one of them stood up and said laws aren't made for the working people right. in this country. Right. So, Betsy Lou Cornett. So, so you, were, you were somehow new to wire up her amongst all the other women. Yeah, and at Duke Power, um, they thought they were so smart because they said, okay, only camera sound can be in. And Is I had already... The, the stockholders the meeting? The stockholders meeting, and I had already wired up about three or four people. So I said... Oh, okay, camera can be in. And I was out in the hall <laughs> regulating the sound, so. That is amazing. And these techniques, I mean, to me, this film is not dated in any way, shape, or form. I still feel like it's such a fresh and insider look at the struggle of working people in this country, and that hasn't ended. And in addition, we have at the end of the, the towards the end of the film, and I heard everybody in the audience sort of gasp for a second is the story of the guy who was shot, Lawrence, who was shot. Lawrence Jones. And uh, the, there was never an indictment filed no indictment. against the shooter. Unbelievable. I Can you just share that story? Well, the part of it I know, and I don't know if you know more from your brother, but uh, no. I, you know, I, I just, I don't, there's a lot that came back to me, but I didn't recall that. It was okay. absolutely shocking. But I thought what Bernie had to say about it was, as you say, as fresh as today. You know, it's exactly yeah. the same issue. If it had been the other way around, that indictment would have been That's right. Down. served in, you know, a New the York minute. And <laughs> you know, the fullest amount of the law. Yeah. Yes. It's well, they dressed astounding. up um, Lawrence Jones in a state trooper's outfit and took him out uh -huh. and saved him. So, I know. So um, in the end, um, the contract was signed. Some of the workers were not so happy with it. Some of them were okay with it. Was it kind of a bittersweet victory for everybody? You mean the very end contract, yeah. I think it was bittersweet. The young people got what they wanted, but I think it was very bittersweet for the older people who didn't get enough of what they wanted and they just had to keep working and struggling even though they could retire. Um, talking about the music in this film. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the music. It's amazing because it's not, none of it's scored music. It's all music that you recorded and Mira, you were in the edit room, you were probably working with some of it. Um, Tell us about that. I mean, I haven't seen a film like this that's really just natural music. And how did you find out about all these amazing songs? Um, well, the first attempt I made was Hazel Dickens. I went up to her. She was at the Smithsonian. Which one is Hazel? She's a cappella. Yeah. Uh, oh, in, Death. In the beginning or at the... On no, the, that's not Oh, Death. Which one is she? Uh, which one? Do you mean she, at the, at the did, meeting? They'll, they'll never keep us down and all the oh, female right. voices that you heard, except for Sarah Gunnings and instead, except for Phyllis Boyens and Nimrod Workman, were um, Hazel Dickens. Uh, and I went and I asked her if she would come and I said, I'm using a lot of your songs. Uh, 
on a film I'm doing on coal miners. And so she came and she listened to it and she loved it. And then there was another guy, David Morris, um, and I went to visit him and I said, I'd like to use some of your so songs too, you know, Dark as a Dungeon and some of the other ones, the Mannington Mine Explosion and some of the others. And he said, no. He said, we don't want outsiders doing our film. And so he and I sat down and uh, played the fiddle together. And then he said, okay, all right. And he's still a friend of mine now. I mean, Hazel would be a f was a friend of mine for a long time. She died a few years ago. And every time Harlan County showed, she would be the surprise guest coming. And Dave Morris, I'm doing a film on homeless veterans. And the reason he was, you know, sort of a little standoffish at the beginning is because he had just gotten back from Vietnam. And he's now going to do the music for the homeless veterans. He was a Vietnam vet. He was homeless in his van, and it totally changed his life. And he's just written the most beautiful songs about veterans and poetry and other things. So he's coming with me next week to do it, my last shoot on the homeless veterans film. So. It's amazing. Um, and as you all know, this film went on to win an Academy Award in 1976. It's interesting, Barbara, because at the end of the film, you asked the minor, you said, has this strike changed you in any way? And I wanted to ask you that question based on what happened during the making of the film, what you learned, becoming so close to all of the minors, then finally going to Hollywood and winning the biggest award there is to win for making a documentary film. Did the making of the film change you in any way? Oh, the making of the film totally changed me. Um, these were my friends. I never knew whether I could go back to New York and live the life that I was living. Um, but I did, and I was in constant contact with them. And the film first showed at the New York Film Festival uh, in New York. and. When I first said to them, you know, I have, I was working in 16 millimeter film and 16 track, and I just said, you know, I have this film that's, you know, in fine cut, and would you see it? And they said, oh no, we don't see films like that. It has to be finished. And I said, well, I know for sure you're looking at a film on Hell's Angels, so why won't you at least look at this film? And so they said yes, and we stayed up all night long, and we did the Q tracks, and we brought it up, and brought it in there, and then I had to leave, and then I came back to pick it up. And there were all these people standing around, and I thought, oh no, you know, the film broke, or the tape broke, or something terrible happened. And the people started cheering, and they said, no, they loved it. They said, Richard Rout only went to the bathroom once <laughs> <laughs> when he was watching the film. And so I went down back to Cabin Creek, which was on 11th Street, and the phone rang, and they said, we'd love to have your film in the New York Film Festival. And I said, no, I'm not going to show it to you. And so. <laughs> Richard Rath said, don't be an idiot, Barbara. And I said, okay, I won't. <laughs> and so we showed it. We also um, did a thousand song sheets for the end of the film so everybody could sing. And the Miners' Wives came, which was really wonderful. And Lois Scott who had just been made the head of the Black Lung Association. She also, if you, she lifted her arm, she had, you know, a uh, tag because she had bought herself a new dress and she, <laughs> she didn't take the tag off. And so during um, the, the film, she finally said at the end, she said, we need to raise money for this film. And there we are at Lincoln Center. And she said, so, could anybody give us a contribution? So people were throwing five and ten and twenty dollar bills on the stage, and I was so embarrassed. I was like <laughs> on the side, 
And she just yelled, not realizing she had a wireless mic on. And she just said, Barbara, you stop that. And you take that money and you stuff it in your bra. We need it. So. That's amazing, don't you? Love, I love Lois. She's incredible. So I, I do think it would, be, it would be interesting to just get some um, questions. Well, I wanted from to just talk about the Academy Award. OK, too, let's talk about the Academy then, Award. OK. They put all the documentarians together. And when it was our time, we crisscrossed arms. And when I heard, you know, Harlan County, two people on either side of me just pushed me forward. And, you know, my little heart was beating somewhere in the auditorium. And Lillian Hellman gave me the award, which was quite remarkable. And the first people I called after it was the people of Harlan County. And they just were screaming and yelling, we won an Academy Award, we won an Academy Award. And they're going all over in their cars and beeping and shooting guns in the air and everything. And then I went down immediately and showed it to them. And the Ku Klux Klan had been there. And so they had hung a goat or something and but that didn't scare us but everybody came people on their hospital beds who had black lung were wheeled in and everybody came and people said why wasn't i in it more why wasn't i in it more so it was it was really wonderful i don't know if you have any other reflections uh, you know just very briefly that there's so much credit due to nancy baker the genius um film editor who went on to edit many other wonderful films including born into brothels which won i think or was nominated and mary lamson and mm -hmm. and one of the things that does come back to anyone who was working then and barbara and i are also laura veterans hayes. of the mazels and laura hayes were these films that would come in with hundreds and hundreds of hours of material, and this was before digital editing. So there was a kind of um, uh, a pilgrimage process that everybody was on for a long, long, long time together because of the way these films were made. And people like Nancy and Laura uh, and Mary were just geniuses at, at, you know, with the filmmaker, finding a way to tell a story this powerful and also it's riveting, it's entertaining. And I think that was a, a product really of that era. And many of us were sort of uh, editor filmmakers or DP filmmakers or, you know, wore many, many, many hats. And that's why these kinds of films got made, I think. No, that's so true. Our first um, cut was eight hours, so. Yeah. I did want to ask you um, about the opening scene, because I think the opening scene is so breathtaking, where yes. the camera goes into the mine with the miners. And you know, in today's vernacular, we would say it was embedded with the miners. But really, it's such a, the first two minutes, you learn so much. And you see it in, from this viewpoint that's incredible. You've never seen it really like that before. So can you just talk about how that opening scene was shot? Absolutely. Um, it was Hart and I, and we went to this mine. It wasn't the one that was on strike. It was up the road a little bit, and we told them we were geology students. <laughs> <laughs> we did. And so the, it was <laughs> a family-owned mine. And so the guy let us in and he let us get up close and personal and it was amazing for us. I mean, it was local and so we were like dragging ourselves, you know, Hart was dragging the camera and I was dragging the Nagra behind me. Um, and it was just quite amazing to see all the equipment, see how they live and they breathe and they eat and they work in that coal mine. It's really extraordinary. And I have to say, I just want to comment on some of your, your style about getting what you need, which is to go in and tell someone you're a geologist, or to fake out a policeman to say, you have your, your ID, it's in the car. I did. <laughs> and then to have the, the temerity to say, well, where's your ID? And that was the end of that scene. Well, no, it wasn't <laughs> the end of that scene, because I found out he wanted to 
get me at night and kill me because they didn't want anyone to film, you know, murder in living color. So when it was nearly over, Houston Elmore said to me, you know, there was a big price on your head. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me? And he said, because we didn't want you to leave. I said, I wouldn't have left, but at least I would have been more careful. But you felt that the miners were really protecting you most of oh, the time. Oh, yeah, we lived with them. They fed us. They took care of us. Um, yes. And, you know, many of them remain friends for many, many years. Uh, when Sudi Cruisenberry died, she's the one with the long hair, and she said, I'm not after a man. I'm after a contract. Yeah. Her daughters all called me to do her eulogy, you know, which I did. So they were very much a part of my life for a long time. Right, that's certainly understandable. Do we, I can take a couple of questions. I think we have a few minutes. How did they survive not getting any money for all that time? Well, they got strike benefits. It wasn't very much. It was $100, I think, a week or a month, I'm not sure. But, and also food was constantly brought in for them. So. And the strike went on for 10 months? Yeah. Hello, yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> your creativity is all over the film, but the, the thing that shocked me the most was the call at the end. All of those organizations and all of those people that you had to round up to support you, that takes another whole kind of set of skills. How did you learn that? Um, well, I learned that there was this organization, and this was early, this was the 70s, that if you were nonprofit, tax exempt, there was something called foundations that might give you money. And mostly they didn't. Mostly they would say, you know, if you ask f for us for money for trees, they won't hurt anybody. So it was very, very difficult. If you notice their names, my mother, my father, my brother, um, instead of getting any, you know, birthday presents or any other presents, different people would give us little bits of money or short ends of film. I mean, it, it was a struggle. And then also the churches would come in. And there were two people who were constantly working on it, and that was Esther Cassidy and Peter Miller. So we had them working and trying to figure out where we could get a dollar in. And lots of times people would surprise us and you know send us $10,000 and we'd be jumping up and down because that was you know a huge amount of money to keep going, so. And despite your phenomenal career, it's still a struggle. Yes, I'm still trying to raise money. <laughs> so Jackie, one more, two more questions, one more? It's late, okay, one more. Okay. You talked about using Inagra and doing work. Uh, over the years, obviously all the gear has changed. Does that change the way you make films? Well, I don't do the sound anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just in general, there's obviously a different crew than what they used to make them. Um, yes, I mean, my nephew does sound, and I use a particular, you know, DP a lot of the time when he's available. And there's also people in this room who I would love more than anything to work with again, like Don Lenzer and other people, wherever Don is, so. <laughs> and the smaller cameras, Barbara? I'm uh -huh. sure the smaller cameras, does that make a difference for you? Well, I'm, I'm a 16 millimeter girl, but we use the smaller cameras. We don't do that anymore, so. I loved that. Yes. I loved using film. I don't know. Don, do you miss film? Um, Probably not. not <laughs> okay. <laughs> Most what DPs do don't because it's too heavy, right? And then you have to change it. Yes. I do. I think it could be made today. I mean, look at the other films that
people are making. Um, I mean, I'm doing this film on homeless veterans and they just wanna pour their hearts out. They just wanna talk about, you know, what they went through. Most of them still have post-traumatic stress syndrome. Sometimes when we look for them, they're off the grid and we can't find them. And I think people want to tell their stories because if you're in the dark, nobody will ever know what's happening to you. So I think, yes. I think this film could be made again, but I hope it won't. <laughs> Well, um, I'm being told we need to wrap up, so thank you so much, everyone. Well, wait, coming. I just want to say some, one last thing. I want to just thank you from the bottom of my heart for putting this together, and Julie and Susan Lacey and all the people that worked on it, and I'm just so proud to have Mira down here with me. So Thank, thank you. you. I do, actually... I just want to say one more thing about Barbara, which is yesterday she was in L.A. giving an award to Robert Redford. She was asked to present an award to him. She took the red eye, came back to New York just this morning to be here for us tonight. So, Barbara, thank you for being here.